Newly released footage shows damage inside Glen Canyon Dam while the facility is still being forced to release water every day. This is not a minor issue, and it is not something that can be fixed quickly and forgotten. This dam controls water and power for tens of millions of people across the western United States. Yet at the very moment when reservoir levels are at historic lows and operational options are nearly exhausted, critical components inside the structure are beginning to degrade. The most dangerous part is not that the dam is about to collapse. The danger is that an enormous system is still operating, but with steadily shrinking ability to control risk when conditions change. Water is still flowing. Power is still being generated. Everything still looks fine. And that is exactly the problem. This video will expose what is happening behind the concrete, why serious warnings have existed for a long time without being clearly explained, and how large the real consequences could be if Glen Canyon Dam is pushed beyond its design limits. One, something inside Glen Canyon Dam started failing first. Something has just occurred at Glen Canyon Dam that is easy to miss if you only look with the naked eye. There was no image of a collapsing structure, no water spilling over the crest, no chaos for live television. What happened this time was far more subtle, and for that reason, more dangerous. It began during a period of high water release, when operators realized that what they were hearing was no longer the familiar sound of a system running normally. At first, it was only a faint vibration, almost more a sensation than a sound. Then came a low hum, dull, flat, not sharp, not echoing, and unlike any mechanical noise or flow pattern they were used to. To an outsider, it might have sounded like nothing more than moving water, but to engineers who have worked with hydraulic structures for decades, sounds like that are never random. In a structure weighing millions of tons, the only thing that produces abnormal sound on its own is material being stressed in a way it was never designed to handle. During that large release, water was pushed through the tunnels at very high speed. On paper, the flow numbers looked ordinary, but inside the tunnels, especially at vertical bends where the flow is forced to change direction abruptly, pressure shifted over extremely short intervals. Water no longer moved as a single continuous mass. It began to separate into layers, forming pockets of low pressure that collapsed almost immediately afterward. Those brief moments created force pulses strong enough to strike directly against the concrete lining of the tunnels. When inspection teams examined the interior, they did not find long cracks. They did not see gradual surface flaking associated with normal aging. What they found were sections of concrete that had been gouged away, as if an invisible tool had been striking the same spot again and again until the material could no longer hold. This damage was deep inside the system, in locations that cannot be seen from the face of the dam or from the river below. What matters most is that this was not slow, cumulative wear over decades. It was not steel quietly corroding or concrete slowly weakening with time. This kind of damage happens quickly when a system is pushed past a threshold that engineers originally defined as safe. Once that threshold is crossed, the material does not adapt. It reacts immediately, and that reaction leaves scars. After the event, flows were adjusted. The tunnels were reinforced. The unusual sound stopped. From the outside, everything appeared stable again. Lake Powell sat calmly. The dam remained intact, showing no visible sign that anything unusual had occurred. But within the engineering community, this was not treated as a simple incident that had been resolved because it left behind an uncomfortable question, one that did not need to be spoken aloud. If a single extreme release produced this kind of response, what happens when conditions once considered exceptional begin to occur more often? If speed, pressure, and operating thresholds are pushed not once, but repeatedly, how do these kinds of damages accumulate over time? What just happened at Glen Canyon Dam was not a dramatic failure, it was a signal. And signals like this, when they appear in large infrastructure systems, rarely stand alone. They are usually the opening note in a longer, deeper, and far less visible chain of problems. 2. The numbers engineers read but never announce. After those unusual sounds appeared and the tunnels were inspected, the story at Glen Canyon Dam stopped being about feelings or speculation. It moved into technical reports, into tables most of the public never opens, let alone reads to the end. And it is inside those dry documents that the seriousness of the problem begins to come into focus. An internal report from the United States Bureau of Reclamation describes very clearly how this dam is operated when Lake Powell drops to lower levels. 
The elevation numbers are not decorative, they are technical red lines. Above a certain level, the system has multiple ways to release water. Below that level, those options disappear one by one. This is not guesswork, it is how the dam was designed from the beginning. These documents state that the emergency spillway, the component capable of releasing extremely large volumes of water in a short time, can no longer be used once the reservoir falls below a specific elevation. Once that threshold is crossed, the system's fastest and safest release option is effectively removed. That means from that point forward, every operating decision must rely on components that were designed for different purposes. Next comes what the power industry and dam operators call minimum power pool, the minimum water level required for power generation. On paper, it is the boundary between a fully functioning system and one entering a restricted operating zone. Below this level, the turbines no longer run steadily. Power output does not decline in a straight line. It drops off sharply. And when power generation stops, what is lost is not only electricity, it is the financial revenue needed to maintain the very system that is under pressure. What is discussed far less is this. When both the emergency spillway and power generation are no longer available, the system is left with only one remaining path to release water. Deep outlet tubes inside the body of the dam, set at elevations far lower than most other components. Those outlets exist, but in the original design, they were not meant to carry the full burden of long-term daily regulation for tens of millions of people downstream. The technical reports do not use words like dangerous or unstable. They use colder phrases not designed for prolonged operation, uncertainty about long-term performance, recommendations to limit continuous use. To someone unfamiliar with technical language, those phrases can sound harmless. To anyone who has worked in infrastructure, they are the clearest way to admit the system is being pushed into conditions it has never been fully tested to endure. One small but important detail in these documents concerns Lake Powell's official water level measurement tools. They were designed to perform best at higher elevations, when water levels drop lower, even the way the system is monitored begins leaning on older assumptions. That tells you something. Even at the design stage, a long-term low water operating scenario was not treated as normal. If you put these pieces together, a very clear picture forms. Not that the dam is about to collapse, not that water will stop flowing tomorrow, but that a massive system is gradually losing layers of safety, one layer at a time, in exactly the sequence engineers warned about in their own reports. These numbers do not appear in press releases. They are not used as headlines, but they say something directly. The lower Lake Powell drops, the more Glen Canyon Dam must operate using options least designed for the present reality. And when a system depends on backup components for long periods, risk stops being a theory and becomes a matter of time. 3. The Invisible Force, Slowly Eating the Dam To understand why the numbers in the previous section concern engineers, you have to pause on a mechanism almost no one can see with the naked eye, yet one that can damage even the heaviest materials. It is not loud. It does not leave long surface cracks. It does not unfold like ordinary gradual aging. It happens quickly, in very small places, and its consequences often become visible only after things have gone too far. Inside Glen Canyon Dam's release tunnels, water does not simply flow downward. It is forced through through narrow spaces, bent along the tunnel geometry, and driven to accelerate as pressure shifts. At certain locations, especially at vertical bends, the flow can enter a condition engineers describe as pressure instability. When that happens, pressure inside the moving water drops very low for an extremely brief moment. Water can no longer stay continuous in the normal way. Tiny vapor bubbles begin to form. They do not last. Almost immediately, as the flow moves into a higher pressure zone, those bubbles collapse. And that collapse is the problem. Each time a bubble collapses, it creates a small impulse, like a very light hammer tapping the surrounding surface. One tap is nothing, but when it happens thousands or millions of times concentrated in the same area, even hard material begins to erode. Concrete does not crack into long lines. It is worn down. It is gouged away, little by little, until the protective layer is gone. What makes this mechanism alarming is that it does not stop on its own. Once flow, speed, and pressure enter the triggering zone, the system has no way to adapt and reduce the impact. In fact, once a surface is damaged, the flow becomes more turbulent, pressure changes grow more extreme, and erosion accelerates. This is a physical feedback loop, not a human choice. Even more unsettling is that this entire process happens in places that are nearly impossible to observe directly during operation. From the outside, the dam stands still. The reservoir surface shows no clear signal. There is no smoke. 
No shaking spreading outward, no image dramatic enough to alert the public. What is happening lies deep inside enclosed tunnels, where only measurement data, unusual sound, and occasional inspections reveal signs of trouble. One key factor that makes this mechanism more dangerous today is the link between reservoir level and pressure inside the release system. When the reservoir is high, the water mass above creates static pressure that helps stabilize conditions inside. When the reservoir drops, that natural pressure layer weakens. That means the same flow rate, through the same tunnel configuration, can carry a higher risk of pressure instability than before. In other words, this mechanism does not depend on whether the dam is old or new. It depends on whether the system is being pushed into conditions it was not originally built to endure. Once it enters that zone, damage may not appear instantly, but it begins to accumulate quietly, and it is difficult to reverse. What worries engineers is not only that this phenomenon has occurred in the past, it is the possibility that it becomes more frequent as operating conditions change. Because once the system must rely more heavily on deep outlets with higher water speeds and lower pressure, this mechanism stops being an exception. It becomes part of a new operating state. From that point on, risk is no longer tied to a single event. It is tied to an unseen physical process, quietly wearing down the very components the entire system is increasingly forced to depend on. 4. How human decisions push the system past design If we stop at the physical mechanisms alone, it is easy to assume that what is happening at Glen Canyon Dam is an unavoidable result of nature. Prolonged drought, declining water levels, more difficult operating conditions. But the picture only becomes clear when we look at how people gradually adjusted the system to meet growing expectations while the structure itself remained largely unchanged. When Glen Canyon Dam was designed, engineers did not imagine it would need to operate in a prolonged low water state like the one we see today. The original drawings, models, and operating assumptions treated very low reservoir levels as rare, short-term situations. They required contingency plans but were never expected to become a permanent operating condition. For that reason, the deep outlets structures inside the dam were built to exist, but not to carry the central role of long-term regulation for the entire downstream system. The problem emerged as the role of the dam changed over time. Glen Canyon Dam gradually became not only a technical structure, but a policy anchor. Water allocation agreements, urban growth plans, and agricultural expansion downstream were built on the assumption that this system could always respond, even as natural conditions deteriorated. Each decision made sense on its own. Taken together, they placed sustained pressure on a structure that was never designed for that kind of operation. In this context, technical limits began to be tested. Operating elevations, pressure thresholds, and safety margins cannot be adjusted to fit policy needs. As inflows declined, the remaining choices were either to continue relying on components once considered backups, or to accept significant cuts in downstream deliveries. In practice, the second option proved far harder to implement. Risk was amplified by a gradual approach. Instead of a clear acknowledgement that the system had entered a new state requiring redesign or a redefinition of its role, measures were applied incrementally, reinforcing tunnel linings in high stress zones, reducing flows where possible, increasing monitoring through sensors and inspections. All of these steps were reasonable, but they assumed the problem could be managed through operational adjustments rather than structural change. Another factor rarely discussed openly is the link between technical operation and financial pressure. As water levels dropped and power generation weakened, the revenue needed to maintain the system declined as well. That made long-term decisions more difficult. The system became trapped in a condition where it had to keep operating in order to sustain itself, even when that meant pushing certain components closer to their technical limits. Seen as a whole, it becomes clear that today's risk is not the result of a single major mistake. It is the outcome of many small decisions, reasonable in their time, but based on assumptions that no longer hold. The delay in acknowledging that shift is what allowed the physical mechanisms inside the dam to grow more dangerous over time. 5. The hidden costs communities can no longer avoid. When risk at Glen Canyon Dam is discussed in technical meetings, it is usually described in dry terms, elevations, flow rates, operating thresholds. But once those limits begin to tighten, their impact does not stay in reports. It moves directly into the lives of communities that depend on the system. 
First comes water, not sudden shutoffs, but changes in how water is managed. When the dam operates near technical thresholds, flexibility nearly disappears. Every release must account for more layers of risk than before. Long-term planning for cities, neighborhoods, and agricultural regions downstream becomes harder. Water is still there, but it no longer carries the same sense of certainty it once did. Alongside water is electricity. Glen Canyon Dam has long been part of the regional power network. When reservoir levels hover near the boundary of efficient generation, output does not decline gradually. It drops in steps, creating unpredictable gaps. Systems that depend on this power must rely on backup sources, which are often more expensive and less stable. These adjustments rarely make headlines, but they steadily increase operating costs. Those costs do not remain at the system level. Over time, they appear in water bills, power bills, and public service costs. Each increase is small but cumulative. For households, especially long-term residents, the change does not arrive as a shock. It arrives as a growing sense that budgets are tightening while choices remain limited. Homes and property are affected in similarly quiet ways. When a major piece of infrastructure is seen as more sensitive to risk, financial institutions and insurers adjust their assessments. Insurance becomes harder to obtain or more expensive. Property values begin to reflect not only present conditions, but long-term uncertainty about water and energy stability in the region. For many people, leaving is not a realistic option. Family ties, community roots, age and cost keep them in place. In that situation, risk does not appear as a visible crisis. It appears as a prolonged state where the margin of safety in daily life slowly narrows. There is no single breaking point to name, yet no clear sense that everything remains under control. It is this combination of long-term dependence and shrinking choices that has made the cost of Glen Canyon Dam's technical challenges unavoidable not through panic, but through steady erosion that is difficult to reverse in everyday life. 6. Warnings existed, yet the system never changed. What makes the situation at Glen Canyon Dam troubling is not the damage itself, but a more uncomfortable truth. These risks were identified long ago. Technical documents, operational notes, and evaluation reports repeatedly pointed to the same issues. Prolonged low water operation, growing reliance on backup components, rising uncertainty as these conditions become normal. These warnings were not written in dramatic language. They appeared as careful technical statements, sometimes as brief notes in appendices. But their message was consistent. There are thresholds the system was not designed to exceed for long periods. There are components never meant to serve central roles. There are operating scenarios with limited real-world experience. The problem was not lack of awareness. It was the absence of a single point of responsibility. Operators were tasked with keeping the system safe day by day, using the tools available. Regulators had to balance technical safety with obligations to deliver water and power to tens of millions of people. Legal frameworks and interstate agreements were built for long-term stability and could not be adjusted quickly as conditions shifted. Each part functioned as intended, but together they lacked a mechanism to change course when original assumptions no longer applied. Within that structure, risk was not ignored. It was deferred. The preferred solutions were those that could be implemented immediately. Reinforcement, restricted use, closer monitoring, incremental adjustments. These steps kept the system running, but they also delayed the harder question of whether the system's role itself needed to change. Past experience shows this is not unusual. In other infrastructure systems, similar warnings persisted for years, considered manageable until extended adverse conditions forced the system to confront its true limits. What later appeared as a surprise was often just the moment when delay could no longer mask reality. Glen Canyon Dam continues to operate today. Water is still regulated, power is still generated, though less than before. That continuity creates the impression that everything remains under control. But a closer look shows the safety margin, shrinking year by year, with decisions increasingly based on the assumption that future conditions will not worsen. In the end, this story does not close with images of collapse or sudden crisis. It closes with a quieter realization. An infrastructure built for a more stable world continues to carry growing expectations, even as its limits have been documented for years. In the gap between knowing and changing, the risk is not a single event. It is the system continuing to operate as if time remains more abundant than it truly is. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.